Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. Our first Patreon goal is 100 Patreon subscribers for $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait. For more information on our Patreon, please go check it out in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today I have a really special guest on Tom Van Atta. Uh, I got that right. First time's charm. That's amazing for me. Mm -hmm. Um, Deep Creek Lake is one of the biggest you have public access to. Yeah. And it's hard to get people to want to talk about that place. It really is. Why is that? And I don't know. I think it's like a lack of fishermen, maybe. Because I go down there once a summer and I fish and people look at me like I'm an alien. Like I'm out there in a fishing boat with a trolling motor and a fishing rod and they're buzzing around me. Like what's this guy doing? Like, you know what I mean? I don't, so I think that you're, there's like a limited pool of people to talk to, to begin with. Mm. It's not like a, not like a Lake Erie or Lake St. Clair where you got thousands of guys fishing it. You know, I mean, I think, I think there's a small number. How That's a shame. It, I think it, it, it really is. It, it's such a, I, I was blessed last year. I got to talk to Matt sell on the podcast who who's mm-hmm. a, he's the Maryland DWR Great agent. episode. dude is knowledgeable. And he told mm-hmm. me like, listen, you got to get your butt up here and I'll take you out. And I was blown away because when he said they're trying to make a pike fishery, a top notch one, I thought it's like, all right, he's trying to hype this thing up and we get out there. I'm like, holy shit. You're not, you're not lying. Yeah, man. It's like the closest thing to Canada I think you're going to get around here. In <laughs> Maryland. like In Maryland, yeah. It's insane. Right by Pittsburgh. Yeah, it's absolutely it's, insane. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and guys, before we get into like the, all the Deep Creek stuff, we get into the juice there. Like, What is your background in fishing? Like, How did you get into this crazy sport? <sighs> oh, man. I mean, I don't know how far into the weeds we want to go with that one. We got three hours. Was... <laughs> True, yeah. Well, I mean, that was like an early, early, early age thing, and that's Deep Creek goes all the way back there, honestly. I mean, I started probably preschool, kindergarten fishing, maybe, and one of the first, like, destinations we went was Deep Creek. Wow. Growing up, I mean, my family, I, I fished locally a lot, like our little ponds and farm ponds, you know, but Deep Creek was, like, the vacation every year that we went to. Like, some kids had Disney World, I had Deep Creek, and I love that, because, like, fishing was it for me. I mean, I played baseball and stuff, but that fizzled out. And by, I'd say by like my teen years, it was just fishing only. Like that's all I really cared about. <laughs> what what state did you grow up in? How how far away from Deep Creek were you? I'm in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania right outside of Pittsburgh. I'm just south of Pittsburgh. Okay. About an hour and a half from Deep Creek. So short little rundown. What got you hooked on it? Fishing in general. Oh man, that's a tough one. I mean, it was, I don't know. I think it was just the, like the, the wonder in it. Like being a kid and going out and just like hope all the time. Like there's that quote, I forget what it is. It's like fishing is like something about like endless chances of hope or something like the perpetual chance for hope, you know? You know that quote? Perpetual chance for hope, yeah. Yeah, and that's that's like what it was as a kid. It was just like mystery. You go out like, I mean, for all I knew, we were going to our local farm pond, but I was going to catch like a shark, you know, in my dumb little kid brain. It was like, it was fun. And then I think I kind of got fascinated in like the intricacies of it, like the gear and the lures and i don't know it, it just stuck with me as a kid as some some kids like cling to instruments or sports and fishing just did that for me i just felt like home kind of from an early age it's addicting the the unknown it's a lottery ticket every time you throw mm-hmm. your line out what you're going to get and well speaking of lottery tickets there's a that's something that you like to chase is basically a lottery when it comes to a muskie Kind of, yeah. Uh, a, a losing one. A yeah. losing one. Often, yeah. <laughs> so like the lottery, yeah. How did that happen? Because Pittsburgh, I think of drugs, crime, and not musky fishing. Like, how did you You're not that? wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're not totally off there. It's um, That's a good one. So, I mean, honestly, I had started dating a girl in college, and she has family in Wisconsin. Oh, and okay. that kind of started the snowball i guess like up to that point i was interested in musky like i thought they were cool but like you said i never thought of pa as a place to like a destination for musky you know mm. so i just always thought maybe i'll go on a trip someday for musky or maybe i'll go somewhere far away you know and we kind of did that we went to wisconsin and i went there and literally all i took with me were like a couple carp rods some bash rods like nothing else and five minutes away from where we were staying there was this gas station and it was a fully loaded tackle shop i mean unlike anything we have around here i can't even compare it i mean you could get your gas or you could get like live 
15 inch suckers for musky or like any musky lure ever made combos so i was in heaven i bought a i bought a musky setup a lure i kind of like got outfitted very rudimentary like a very rudimentary setup like an entry level setup and that week i, I just plucked away for him i didn't didn't even see a fish i lost like four or five lures i mean it was a mess it was not fun but i came home and i was kind of like all right well now i have this musky set up what am i going to do with it and kind of like started looking around researching places i could go had a chance at least and i did that and that was kind of a failure too <laughs> like just about as successful as wisconsin was i mean that was i think a probably a year of fishing just strike out strike out didn't see fish might have had a follow here or there but didn't catch a fish for a solid year and like dude i fished my butt off like I, i'm self-employed i do graphic design so i don't mm. have to like be at work nine to five i can work at my leisure like, <laughs> i can work overnight if i want so i mean i'm talking i'd fish all freaking day like every day and i wasn't even seeing musky and i guess i was just doing it all wrong because then at some point i kind of i got involved with like our local clubs we have like a musky zinc club Huh. And I started to go, yeah, it's like there's chapters all around the country and one happens to be like right around our area. So I got involved with like those guys and started going to expos and met some like-minded people and kind of got a little direction and realized like PA is like kind of awesome for musky actually. <laughs> like we're in the golden day up here, truthfully. That That's that's surprising to me that, that PA is really mm-hmm. known because the one thing if I think of PA besides the Susquehanna River is the trout fishing. Like, mm. what was the big change then in your, I guess, I don't know, your skill level, the technique? When did you bag your first one, and what was that like? Oh, man. First one, I think, was like 2016 or 17, maybe. And I, like, I, like I said, I kind of started going for them around here because I got bored with other stuff. Like, I could go out any day and catch carp, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not trying to sound like a cocky jerk, but, like, I think you're the same way. Like, if I want to go catch bass, I can go to the farm pond and catch bass. Mm. Or I can go down the road and catch carp or channel cats on hot dogs. Like it's 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 fun, but at the end of the day, I'm not like pushing myself. So that's what got me into that was pushing myself and pushing myself. And it finally happened in like 16 or 17. And stupidly enough, like this is how this happened. So I told you I fished for a year nonstop, like relentless. Like I was these muskies worst enemy, even though I wasn't, didn't catch one. But I fished relentlessly. And then the one night I got a lure stuck in a tree. I was bank fishing and it Stuck up in the tree. I broke it off. I'm like, I'll come back and get that tomorrow because it was getting late. So I came back the next day with my rod, no lure. I think I had like, I didn't, I might not even have my backpack with me. I just wanted to get that lure out of the tree. That was my goal. So I got it down and I had my rod with me. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to fish. I'm here. Why not? Mm-hmm. And that morning is when it went down. Do you remember it? I had no, oh, dude, remember every second of it. I mean, it was a mess. Like everybody's first musky isn't pretty. Like a lot of uh, anybody that fishes for musky will tell you that it's kind of like a bloodbath, mud bath. Like what happened? You're not prepared. What happened? Well, so I said I fished for carp. I shouldn't. Uh, p- internet people are going to crucify me for this, but I can I can admit this now. But so I, I was a carp fisherman, and kind of how you handle carp is you know you bring them up on the bank, you do your best to keep them wet, maybe like you, you just get them back in the water. Musky man, you don't bring them up on the bank. But I was a carp fisherman, so I had a tarp with me that I would always put my carp on, and then I'd, like, dump a bucket of water on my carp, you know, keep them wet, get your picture, get them back in. So that's how I handled my first muskie. I had a tarp. I drug it up on the bank, threw it on the tarp, dumped the bucket of water on it, took my pictures, and sent her on her way. What was that bite like, though? Was it was it a surprise, and then it was just the heat of the moment of you got bit by the shore, and then you drug him on, or is it he followed it a couple of casts, and then you actually got the bite? It was a top water bite, like right at daybreak. Oh, wow. So I, I was kind of, I don't even think I was looking. I was probably like looking down at my reel and I just heard and felt it and looked up and oh, that was it. Dude. And I mean, it's, it's not long. It's not like a catfish fight where you're fighting them for 20 minutes, you know, it's like quick. Like they're, but still your right first in one in top water. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's a funny thing where I, where I can't take too much credit. Where I fished was kind of like top water only. It was a real sketchy area. You weren't weren't getting away with too much besides top water. But you still got it your first one on top water. That's true. Yeah. That's which is fun. Yeah. Addicting. And a lot sense, man. I, I still love top water to this day. It's still like my favorite thing to do. Really? Here. Yep. Yeah, man. It's like through the night, the night fishing and the top water, that's that's like my my bread and butter. I think I catch more like in the dark in a year on top water than in the day at this point. Is it a seasonal thing? 
as far as like weather and like time of year with top water yeah for me around here absolutely yeah like this time of year in the summer when they're all fired up like i'm not gonna be i mean some guys do i'm sure it works for some guys but in october or november i'm not gonna be like throwing top water in the middle of the night mm. but summer i mean you're dealing with a lot of hot water in the summer too and you might get a little cool down at night and there's a lot of things working right in the summer for it i guess how far did you have to start traveling just you know, without you don't have to give away your, your absolute juice, but was it starting in Pittsburgh and and traveling? Was there a lot of local places, or was it more of like, okay, this is an event for me to go to? So it started. I was going to a lot of local places. I mean, fifteen, twenty, thirty minutes. That's not bad. Okay, not bad. But that the places closest to me are kind of like needle in a haystack. Like you're talking the Three Rivers, which they have musky. They're they're good musky fisheries. But then you go a little north, the lakes like. I'm a tuning or like the stocked lakes. I mean, you're that's, that's like where you want to go. If you need reps, like if you're, if you're looking to catch a lot of musky, you go to like a stocked musky lake. Hmm. It's like any, it's like trout or any, you know what I mean? Like some guys might frown upon it or whatever, but like the truth is like, you're going to get the most practice at somewhere they stock musky every year, you know, where you don't have to go looking for it. Like I did for a year to get one bite. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or somewhere you can go out a couple in a day and have five opportunities that's where you're gonna learn the most about the fish i think and that's you're talking like two three hours for me to get to one of those lakes that sucks now i don't think we brought this up so i'm sorry for repeating here but are, are you right. still bank fishing or are, are you doing a boat or something like that yeah i do both i oh, do both. i mean some of they're like with our three rivers there are a lot of creeks and tributaries and stuff and some of them aren't really accessible by boat so you do Maybe have a, a boat jet. though I do, yeah. Okay, I do gotcha. have a boat for the lakes, yeah. In Deep Creek. That makes sense. Okay, cool. Because, yeah, that was my next yeah. question is, like, if you were just bank fishing, how would that lurk around a lake in the rivers? But since you have a boat, that opens up things completely. Um, it does. When you're hitting all these places. It does. I mean, I still have, like, a soft spot for bank fishing, though. Like, I just love it. Like, you get the, you get the boat, you get all yeah. the gear, and so at the end of the day, there's still something about, like, putting the boots on and but there's a convenience, and- I swear to God. Like, and maybe it's a, ba- I know it's not a bass fishing thing. That's true. Like, we all are addicted to buying tackle. I don't care w- yeah. what you go after. Oh, you're telling me, man. <laughs> I mean, but your stuff is way more. I will say that your stuff is, whew, my God. Some of those things that you guys have is expensive. It can be. It, it doesn't have to be, but it, I mean, it, it gets to be that way. It's like anything. Like, you can go golfing for cheap, but who does that? Like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Or and, and- you could, it's, there's a lot of basement builders that their their baits are like works of art. And I mean, it comes down to like, what do you want to get paid for 14 hours in a bait? I'm sure it's like bass fishing, man. I mean, the swim baits, oh, like I've seen the yeah. swim baits seeing like hundreds of dollars because that guy sat there for a day, maybe more, you know? And that's the one thing I, I was literally, what I was going to bring up is like, yeah, look at the swim bait market. I mean, if you're making handmade mm-hmm. baits, of course it's going to be more expensive. But then mm-hmm. it, it, to me, what's just interesting about that is when I went out with Matt, you know, I was using my extra heavy swim bait rod, which was basically perfect for, for what we were doing with Pike. Um, it, it is, everything is bumped up tackle wise and everything is just a little different in how you do it. Um, mm-hmm. which I think does scare some people away from getting into either Pike or musky fishing is you do need to kind of update your tackle a little bit just to make sure you don't get a little hurt. bit, a little bit. But as far as like, if you're coming, we're talking bass, if you're coming from like a bass mentality or like a bass background, like you're golden. You are, you're so far ahead of the rest of the pack. Like all really all you need is the gear. And then you just got to tweak a little bit of that mindset. And I mean, it's the same deal. Like bass fishing, you're kind of target, you know what I mean? You're target fishing. You see that bush, that, that bush looks fishy. There's probably a bass there. going to present my lure in the best way to that bass. It's like, it's no different with a muskie. Everything's just bigger, a little faster. Like you're dealing with a fish that can swim faster, eats bigger. And but at the end of the day, it's, it's a fish. It's like, it, fish that eats other fish it's a fish that eats other fish and i would say that it seems like musky are a lot more territorial and the amount that mm-hmm. you have per area and i just know this from all the, the dwr guys i've had on this show the past two years and they talk about for the shenandoah river or the upper potomac they're very you're not going to have an over it seems like an overpopulation problem with muskies like you would flathead catfish as an example like and i think that's just interesting because you're hunting it seems like you're hunting a lot more with musky oh yeah definitely are and especially bank fishing i mean i tell guys that's like hunting in a tree stand i mean a lot of the times you're in a spot like at a river you're waiting for a muskie to come to you mm. like you might not be able to move you might be 
lead feet in a spot, hoping that you picked a good spot, like a convergence point where muskie are going to travel through and kind of like deer hunting, you know, like you're picking a neck down where deer are traveling through. You, you might do the same bank fishing with muskie. You might pick like a little transition spot out of a creek into another creek or, you know what I mean? It, so it's, that, it's a lot like hunting. It definitely it, is. It really is. You're opening my mind yeah. to a whole new thing. And I didn't even know there was all these kind of just different, these tribes, um, you know, these musky clubs, like that's, that's awesome that that's mm-hmm. actually a thing. And that's a huge resource too. I mean, like I said, just putting yourself around other people and finding out what you're doing wrong and what you're doing right. And well, getting some buddies to go with. That's, that's a good segue to, you went from finding like-minded people to starting basically a podcast with like-minded other people. We did. Yes, we did. So that was like, I don't even know how that happened. We, we were kind of talking about that a little before, whose idea it was out of us five. But yeah, we got the Musky Hunks podcast, and that just kind of came into existence one summer. We we were joking about it, me and my buddy Owen, for a long time. Then we kind of assembled a group of other musky fishermen, and they wanted on board with it. They're like, let's do it, let's do it. And one night, we just happened. And I mean, once you do one, you kind of have to keep doing them, right? <laughs> can't just flake out like yeah so we did one and we're like well crap you know we're stuck now like but you got no, it's been it's been a blast man it's in all honesty it has been an absolute 80 blast. episodes is is a tip of the cap because it's hard to do Thank this you. a lot of people will do one or two and then they just give up and so it it's is, either and it's, yeah and it's tough man it's five guys i mean it's five hard-headed grown men that want to do things their way and things don't always go well and you know what i mean it's it gets tough at times but it's it's been really rewarding we've talked to people like i mean i don't know if you're familiar with people in like the musky game like joe booker i've heard of him he's a he's a legendary author guide like lore maker we got to talk to him oh. joe Cermelli from field and stream and hope we could talk to him like just it's like open these doors to talk to people like three four years ago i never would have guessed like i would have talked to him how much is that because everyone this is so funny everyone talks about like okay if you do this you're going to become like rich and have six houses and i don't think people talk about this part it's your knowledge the amount of knowledge you get just from like you get to be in the room with joe sermelli when the mics aren't on and you get to ask questions it makes you a better fisherman it does it does and it's like the communities you're exposed to and we haven't made a dollar by the way that that Mm. that rich thing like we're not joe rogan man we haven't made a freaking penny there's only one joe rogan yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. <laughs> this is very true. Yeah. yeah. But it's like, like you said, just the, the knowledge you acquire and the people you meet and like the friends you make, like most, my phone, most of the day are people somehow related to the podcast in one way or another, mm-hmm. like whether it's my buddies or people I've met through it or like we had a buddy, we had him on, uh, Ryan Elizondo. He's a tiger musky fisherman from Washington state. And he flew out last year to go to our musky expo, like stayed the weekend with us in the hotel. Dude, and stuff. that is so and, cool. Yeah, so, like, these are the kind of friends you're making in it, because, like, kind of like we said at the beginning with Deep Creek, I mean, fishing as a whole is not, like, a big thing. Like, it's 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 a big thing, but not compared to football or soccer, you know, baseball. And then you look at muskie, and that's, like, even tinier sliver of that, like, pie chart. That's it's just minute how many people do that, so. But what's nice that, you're able to, yeah, with that podcast, what it does is it amplifies that voice for other like-minded people to find you. And it's so crazy how it, huh. it highlights these groups now does yeah and it's a blast it's just it's fun and i like at times i don't feel deserving like we talk to these people joe and like i'm like why are they wasting their time talking to people like us like at the end it it feels like i feel guilty but lucky you know like i'm very thankful grateful but 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 that's a great ride and i think it's gonna keep growing um i mean your dialogue the way you guys like banter off of each other that's always juicy i mean the hardest thing to do in this industry podcasting or emceeing is talking to a camera by yourself it's so yeah. nice to have people it's really nice oh for sure for sure and it's even before getting on this i had like the jitters i'm like when i get on mine i don't i don't feel like jittery because like if we screw it up like i got four guys to back me up yeah. you know what i mean like tonight like man it's like if i screw up i don't want to screw the fish in the dmv up <laughs> like it's just me i don't i don't have my usual troops with me to get my back it's no, no, we'll, intimidating man. I, i'll be gentle with you um I hope. it's and i really want to do it this way guys just to kind of set up you know your background not only do you have you know the musky background not only do you now have the podcast about musky fishing and you're pretty you're pretty well versed with the toothies and that kind of sets up into deep creek and we'll, guys don't worry we'll talk about the bass fishing too but they are making 
a legit pike fishery there, which is insane. And I think you mentioned this to me on a message. There are a lot of musky guys that don't like pike too. Yeah, you would think, mm. and maybe it's because I'm a noob. Like, well, okay, chase whatever you can. But that's a thing, isn't it? That some musky guys don't like pike. It is, and I think so. I mean, there are guys around here that hate pike too. Like, I have friends that think pike are dumb, but that's I think a lot in the Midwest where pike are like very prevalent they're almost like invasive and annoying like around i mean i know i don't know about down by you but up around pittsburgh pike are kind of like the unicorn like if Mm. you get a pike in the three rivers that's cool like they're not they're not destroying your musky lures like they are out in the out in wisconsin or minnesota or so me i love them i love seeing a pike that makes sense because i know when i would go up and fish college tournaments on lake champlain and you have pike just blow up your lures but Mm. I think the difference here is I think people get like when you have pike that are in those runty size classes, that's one thing. I, and I haven't been blessed. I don't know if you have gone up to like the, the the Canadian shed area where you get the legit ones, which I would love to do someday in my life. Mm-hmm. When you get to that 30, 40, 58 class range on a, on a pike, though, I feel like, dude, that's completely different than a bunch of runts. It is. I think Matt, so you were talking about Matt. So, um, he was talking about that a little bit, how they're just like different breeds almost. And they, I mean, I, I, like I said, I'm no biologist. I'm no tournament angler. I'm not qualified to speak officially, but from what I've seen, I agree with that wholeheartedly that little pike and big pike, they just behave differently. And that now there are times of the year, like the spawn where like most you know, pike for the most part are all shallow, like big, small, they're all in one area. But for the most part, the rest of the year, the big pike are behaving very differently. They're going to be like in different places, acting differently, eating at different times. It's strange. Compare and contrast in the difference in pike behavior and musky behavior when they get to be about the same size, like, you know, let's say 40 inches. I think that's kind of when you start to see the overlap, honestly. Like, that's really? why, like, it appeals. To, I, I mean, I, I, I can't say for sure, but that's kind of why it appeals to me and why I like Deep Creek so much because chasing the big pike feels a lot like chasing the musky. I mean, you're fishing a lot of the same kind of depths and structure and cover and a lot of the same lures Hmm. and presentations and and that could be a self-fulfilling prophecy i mean right there but it just it seems like the bigger ones act different that makes sense that makes a lot of sense because i've always been curious to ask like a a, a musky hunter like yourself like if they're where (laughs) the overlap is and where it's not um because you know again the musky fish the ten thousand casts whether that's rightfully so as a title or not um it's a very prized game fish, but then if you get a pike mm. of the same size, it doesn't have the same oomph, that same punch. Oh, it does for me, man. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I think I'll, it's it's tough to say, but I think a lot of it too is kind of like you got. I don't know. I forget where I was going with that, but we got like you got like a little pike and a big must or a little pike and a. I forget where I was going with that, man. We might have to cut that. I had a thought and it went away <laughs> from me there. Do you ever do that? It slips all the time. Um, no, but I, I, I think I, I see where you, what you're, what you're putting down there. The, the pike with me, I think, was so interesting about like the fishery, like we said, like a deep creek, which we're getting into, is now that they're growing trophy caliber, legit donks in that place. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you're going to see more and more musky anglers start converging on that thing to try to actually tangle with them like yourself. I, w- I, I would hope. I mean, I don't see why not because, like I said, I don't think it's the musky guys hate pike. I think they just hate pike when they're musky fishing. Yeah. Right? Uh, it's like a bycatch. It's Yeah, and, it, and maybe hate's a strong word, but it's not as desirable. Um, would, yeah. would probably be a, a would be better wording there with that. True. Now, what what is your history and in, in, in kind of like with Deep Creek Lake? Like, and we uh, talked about yeah. your childhood, but when did you start like taking the boat out there and getting serious with it? Well, so my boat, I just got my boat in 2016. That's when I would have started taking it. But as a kid, we would always get rentals. And then eventually we got our own bass boat, this old crusty two stroke thing that would like smoke the launch ramp out. But we would take it to Deep Creek and would fish. And but just, I'd say hardcore the last six, seven years out of my boat. Wow. That's insane. That's more than I've had there. What, what have you seen with that lake this time of year? In the summer? In the summer going into September. Um, so I've never been, like I said, my my experience there is I get to go for a week or two a year. And that's my snapshot of Deep Creek. But that, over the years, I've kind of seen changes. And, 
And I think what I had actually written down for one of the biggest changes I've seen is just like we talked about earlier is the fishermen disappearing. Hmm. I don't know why that is, but in the summer, you're saying like one of the things in the summer is, and this is no secret. Anyone that knows Deep Creek knows this is fishing is hard in the summer, not because, not because of the fish, because of the people. And it's not because of the fishermen. It's because of the boat traffic. boaters. Yeah. Uh, yes. Boat traffic, partying, all that fun. And that's hard when you, when you deal with this, like with a Lake Anna, a Deep Creek, that's, it's not 30,000 yeah. acres. And that really does become a problem. And, and, that's the one though, I think luxury I had or, or blessing was when I went, it was mid to late October when I went up with Matt and it was like, dude, this whole place is yep. to yourself. It's insane. And that's when a lot of the, I guess the hardcore pike and kind of guys are going to stick with that. You know what I mean? Like in the times where you're not running into the wreck traffic, but I guess through the years I've kind of gotten used to it. I don't, I don't want to say I love it, but it doesn't, bother me as much anymore because that's the only time i get to go really you know what i mean it's a summer well, vacation for us and generically what time it of is year what it do is you, go? you say summertime it's like peg that a little bit down yeah so we've kind of mixed it up i mean when i was little i can't remember but we the past few years we've gone in july which has been a circus in this mm. past year we actually went in june which i guess we somehow we must have made it like the weekend before peak season because we come into town from Pittsburgh over the one bridge in the lake where you get like a good view down the lake. And I'm looking out over the lake and I think it was like a Friday afternoon when it should have been a circus out there. And I didn't, I think I might've saw like a boat or two. And I looked at my girlfriend, I'm like, did we come to, is there like a regulation out that we're not allowed to be out here right uh -huh. now? Cause this, something's wrong. You know what I mean? But I think, I think if you can time it just outside of that summer season, like June, I get, like I said, June is apparently when rates change and when they consider peak season at some point in June shift from then on all through the summer it's tough what, what do you see traffic, with the traffic, fish behavior traffic. specifically let's just start with the pike that with with all that boat traffic and the pressure so the pike i mean uh, my t it, the past few years my windows have been in the morning and in the evening obviously i mean i think that's kind of standard for a lot of pike and musky stuff but i don't hmm. think they're as bothered by the traffic because where I'm fishing a lot of the pike, I'm not in tight away from traffic. I'm kind of like open water weeds. Like pike love weeds. So anywhere you find weeds, there's usually pike. And when you're on weeds, I mean, you could be out in the middle of the lake, like right in a freaking like highway of boat traffic. And it's, it seems like as long as they have somewhere to get out of that, they're yeah. all right. You know what I mean? Like as long as they can tuck up out of it, they're fine. But I don't think no, they prefer no. it by any means, but maybe they're kind of used to it, honestly, because that's, uh, that's and that's why I know. Like that's I fish, um, I fish a local Thursday nighter on the Upper Potomac. It's called Big Slack, and the boating traffic there. I think it was, okay. it was actually two Saturdays ago. I actually fished a, an all dayer there, and the boat traffic was terrible. But in the main gut of it, even though the boat traffic was bad. There were fish still on areas. They were used to it. It didn't bother them because they had enough water underneath them, I mm -hmm. think. I really think it comes down to displacement. If you have boats running back and forth mm -hmm. in, let's say, sub 10 feet and a boat rips through there, that's a lot of water displacement. But if it's, yeah, yeah it's completely different. But I different think you're story, right there. Yeah. It kind of makes sense, though, when you think about it. Like a big predator is probably not going to give a shit about a boat coming back and forth. It's not a perch or something like that. Mm -hmm. No, they see it all day. Yeah. And I mean, like I said, I don't, I don't think it turns them on i don't think they see the boats zipping around and go like oh yeah like dinner time but i don't i don't think it puts them down quite like it may bass in shallow water or perch like you said do, or do panfish or because i've i don't know go for it, I've, go for it. I've, i think of, i'm sorry man it interrupt you but like i, th I think i think of like one example like i'll fish a weed bed and i'll i'll fish down it on my trolling motor all stealthily then i'll like zip back up it on the outboard not even getting out of the way like right back up the weed bed come back down hmm. it on the trolling motor and then one hits it's like, so either that fish just popped into that weed bed or it didn't care at all That's that I was burning over it. Hmm. Like, like how do, yeah. how do pike and muskie, let's just go specifically pike here. How do they situate on weeds? Is it kind of like bass or is it completely different? So that kind of goes back to, we were talking about like the difference between the big and little ones, I think. And this is all theory like this. I can't prove any of this, but I think. I've thought I've talked about this with buddies too, and I think like the little ones are more like on edge, right? They're they're kind of in hiding mode because they're still up uh, until they're a certain size. Like you've seen the viral videos mm -hmm. of big pike carrying small pike around, 
like till they reach a certain age, they're still food, you know, so they kind of got to look over their shoulders. Then they, once they hit a certain age, I feel like they can kind of ease up a little bit. And that's when they kind of focus just on hunting. And you got to remember like they're a predator, like those big pike, they're a predator and predators need somewhere to hunt. Like they need somewhere to ambush, somewhere to hide, you know, you might have pelagic pike that are out over they bait. They do that? You know, there's a school really? bait in open water and they're busting on bait. Huh. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. Pike and musky, yeah, for sure. But like, but for the most part, they're they're hunters, you know. So think of like a lion. A lion's like hiding behind a tree. It's not in the middle of the field. Like, that's interesting. I didn't know that that's how I look at it. Anyway. That's pretty cool. Oh yeah, I mean, I've I've never caught them like open water like that. But I know. I mean, Matt Sell even talked about it. A lot of guys is frowned upon as it is. They'll just fish below a thermocline, like not really on cover, just kind of pelagic thermocline hmm. out in the middle of nowhere looking for cool water and sometimes well, pike will set up there but well, i like to fish mean, for let, them let, let's get right into that then with with bait setups like what is the best what are your top three baits then this time of year and then even throw us some uh some fall transition baits so fall i haven't fished deeper i'm gonna have to rely on my buddy there I, I, we'll talk about him too but in the summer man I, and it's up here too. Pike love glide baits. And I don't know if glide baits in a musky sense are different than the bass sense. So I want to clarify that. But like our glider is like, what's your glider? You think of like the jointed I, segmented kind of. You know what? Let me just go grab when one. I say glider. Okay. I'll see if my glider is the same as what you're thinking. There's a miscommunication here, I know, between bass guys and between bass guys and pike guys. There's like a miscommunication between glide bait, I know. Okay, yeah. So that's yeah. like the traditional bass glider, I think of. And like a musky really? guy would call that a swim bait. I think. Huh. Yeah, I think that's like I hear a lot of musky guys refer to those as a swim bait. So like this is this is what we call a glider right here. I don't It's just like a, it's a, a unjointed, I don't know how you'd describe it. It's kind of like a subsurface Zara spook, is how I'd put it. It's got like a how walk the that, dog action under the work? water. Like it sinks. Yeah, it's it's a lot like your glide bait, but you you work it with pops of the rod okay. instead of like reeling it. But it it's think of a Zara spook and sink so a Zara it, spook like eight feet down. It's not a suspending That's bait, like it is a sinking bait, bait then. You yeah, you, but you can weight them in ways that they they're somewhat neutrally buoyant. You can find glider glider or people that make gliders that are completely neutrally buoyant. Hmm. Like, can you add a weight to make them sink? It's it's like a that's a whole nother rabbit. So within what the musky is, what is the difference then? No. A paddle tail, and then a are these both considered swim baits? Huh. A paddle a boot tail versus a glide in bass world. So I'm not like a hardcore bass guy, but I, and I would tell you a musky guy wouldn't really? call okay. the rubber a swim bait. I don't think it, it's weird. Yeah. But like, and I, and I get what you're saying there. Like I, I kind of yeah. call that a swim bait cause it has a paddle tail, but the guy, musky guys kind of blanket. Everything is like rubber baits. There's like rubber baits, which are like your curly tails, your paddle tails, your everything tails. Dude. And then like. <laughs> Glide baits or these kind of hard. You want to give a bass guy a panic know, man, attack? You just say all then, this plastic okay. baits are just plastic. There's no categories or anything. <laughs> yeah, just just soft plastic. Yeah, I know, man. It, it's nuts. And then so another one, a jerk bait in our sense is not like a crank bait. It's not like a jerk bait like you're thinking. A jerk bait for us, yes. Is more like I a, fish with one of those before. Suic. I think. Uh, yeah, it's, it's like a okay yeah it's like a it suit. doesn't have a That's bill like a uh, i, I fished a, a soft one too i think it was like a tube with like yeah. 50 hooks but you just yeah you whip the rod tip and to get it to dart yeah and the, the yeah. tail the tail is what makes it dive that's what like a musky guy would or i mean there are jerk baits that dive from the nose but yeah that's a whole nother rabbit hole but just to get our vo that, that's a long rabbit hole to get our vocab so. straight on glide bait but Moral of the story, glide bait is glide number bait. one if I'm going biking. Yeah, for sure. There's something about that that action. Like, you know the action of a Zara spook that walk the dog. There's something about that subsurface that just makes a pike, like, so mad. That that back and forth. Why not a, Why not something with some shine, bait. like a spinner bait or an inline spinner or something like that? 
Um, they, a bucktail. We so a bucktail. We call an inline spinner a bucktail. So uh, if if you hear me say bucktail, that's it. That's an inline spinner. But we we I, I use inline spinners and bucktails definitely. Yeah. But you'd be hmm. surprised at the glide these things throw. So like a, when I'm saying they're walking like a Zara spook, at the like they go left, right, left, you know, hmm. and in between they kind of roll. Like they, they have like a belly roll. That, that depending on your paint pattern, that'll throw cool. a lot of light too. That little roll. So you'd be you'd be surprised. What are you rigging that with? What's that your have. setup? I'm usually using like a lighter musky setup, and I know Matt Matt throws like a real heavy musky setup, and I think that's because he's fishing in the fall. And, and traditionally, fall is when your baits get a little bigger. Everything gets a little bigger and slower. And but in the summer, I'm using like my lightest musky setup. I think it's a medium heavy. A uh, triumph musky rod so it's like a it's basically the equivalent of like a frog and bass hmm. rod pretty much like a heavy frog and rod i think it's rated like 45 now, are you cranking all the way up to maybe. 80 pound braid or what what is your line set up yeah so musky i'll go i'll be ridiculous in musky i'll go like 100 or 120 just for like the added security like if that line gets nicked it's not not that weak but pike you're like that smaller pike setup, it's a smaller, like 300 sized reel. So 80 okay. pounds, 65 pound, 80 pound, you're good. You don't really have, I don't think you have to. Yeah, I've always been curious 80. about that. And I think you're actually the best guy to ask. When it comes to braid, uh, you're better than me. Whew, I don't know about best. <laughs> 65 to 80 to 110 to 200. When do you notice the difference yeah. in the size? Like, is there a huge difference between 100 and 120? Is there a big difference between 80 and 100? <sighs> I think that depends on manufacturer too, because you'll see a lot of like the cheaper braids are a little thicker in diameter sometimes. But I don't know. I mean, I'd say when you get above like eighty, it's getting pretty thick, and you're gonna need like a bigger, like would say a five hundred sized musky reel, like a big faced musky reel. Otherwise, it's just kind of uncomfortable, and you notice some casting issues. But with that said, you can get 100 pound braid for like I'm mm. thinking of one Power Pro Max Quattro. It's everything's a step down in size. So your 100 pound braid's the size of traditional 80, your 80s, traditional 65, 65, 40. You know what I mean? So, but I don't know. I, like the the 100 and like 120 pound test, that's obviously not because you think you're getting 120 pound musky or 120 pound pike. That's. It's just like frogging for bass. It's just the insurance. So it comes down to like how sketchy are you getting, you know? Are you fishing cover? Are you fishing rocks? How are much are you, or... how many situations will you be slack lighting a hook set with a, with a muskie or a pike in this? So example is, you said the frog. Classic example, you've seen a ton of YouTube videos, the guy slack lining on a frog mm-hmm. and you get that jolt. It mm-hmm. seems like with the videos I watched today on the subject, a lot of it is you're cranking and then you're just loading up onto them. Yeah, I mean, that's the only time your slack line hook setting is either live okay. bait fishing, so like sucker fishing, or kind of if you get caught sleeping, I feel like. Like if you get caught in between a jerk and you come back to and that fish is there, then maybe. But for the most part, you're, like you said, kind of just loading up on them and trying to keep the fish down, trying to keep it from coming up and shaking, like instinctively you set the hook the rod tip i mean a lot of guys will disagree with that but for me i set the hook and that rod tip goes down and i try to direct that fish down it's like bass fishing like you hook a big bass you don't want them coming up as cool as it is to watch you don't want that bass coming up to the top with his mouth open it's the same the deal when you're to throw dealing a with a muskie or pike insane. and when it comes to the trebles are what brand do you mm-hmm. like to, do you like to flip out for new ones do you just file them So sharpening's a must. That's like you. That's almost as necessary as pliers when you're talking pike and musky. Like if you forgot your sharpener, that's that's bad news. So, but the brand, I mean, guys are all over the field about that one. Like there are guys that swear by bronze hooks. They hate black nickel, and there are guys that swear by black nickel and hate bronze. And I'm kind of somewhere in the middle there. I like any kind of black nickel hook. I think it's a little more prone to rusting it's also harder to sharpen because black nickel has like this heavy coating on it that you have to wear through before you can really get a good point on those big hooks. Whereas a bronze, you take a bronze hook, like some, the hook comes to mind. Mustad, they make a lot of bronze. 3551 is a popular musky hook. And that you swipe it like two times with a file, it's sharp. 
but that's going to, you leave it on your dashboard overnight, it's going to get rusty. You leave it in a box, it's going to get rusty. It's, Are they cheaper? A little more bendy. That makes sense. Okay. They're cheaper. So that's, that's a big trade off. Yeah. But, the, but, Hmm. It is, but some guys prefer that. Some guys, like I, I started making rubber baits and I put the black nickel ones on them and I have friends that hate black nickel. They're like, I'm going to put mustads on that the second I get it. Hmm. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's all personal preference. And it's, I, like I said, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. I don't, I like the, I like the properties of black nickel that it doesn't rust as easy, but I'm not going to take bronze hooks and it's board. interesting because like if you I need get... that for you guys that haven't actually tried a musky or pike fishing i the ones i ended up catching this is funny as hell but i ended up catching them on a swim jig when i was with matt a, a pike swim jig and i tell you you set the hook it's like nice. setting a hook into a pile of concrete good god they have hard mouths that's insane mm-hmm. how hard those mouths are yeah and that's why that sharpener comes into play because it's it's you, you get these hooks and they look so deadly, right? Especially like a big pike or a musky lure. They got a big hook on them. It looks scary. It looks sharp. But then if you like me, we have our glasses, right? So I'm I have to take my glasses off and look really close at the hook. But if you look, you'll see some of those points aren't perfect. Like from the manufacturer, one might be ruled, one might not be sharp, and you can give them the old nail test just like you do a bass lure. But that's that sharpener, man. If you don't have a, one sharp point, that could be the difference between hook and a fish and not okay. when you're talking pike and musky. And going into that, what sure. type, and I know this is something that I learned from having some musky guys on, what type of net do you like to use or, or have on your boat? Because I know that's very important. Anything big. Big. Anything big. Yeah, anything big, man. Because it's, it's not, a, a part of it is getting a big fish in the net, but part mm. of it is that the net acts as a live well. It's kind of like when I said, when I first started musky fishing, I knew no better. I, I drug that thing right up on the bank, threw it on a tarp like a carp, just about put my boot on it to keep it still. I had no idea that these were like pristine yeah. fish, like 30 year old. You know what I mean? So the, the net acts is alive. Well, when you get them up to the boat or the bank, like you want a nice big net to accommodate that fish. So it's not all like donutted up in the net and sideways and upside down. And that, that allows you some space to keep that fish in the water, get those hooks out. Do what you got to do. You know, it, get it's insane because there's just no place that really sells a lot. Like a Dick Sporting Goods, they have they have your bass guys, they have your trout guys, a little bit of catfish guys, but they don't have a lot of stuff for, mm-hmm. for your musky and your pike guys. Nope. And I'll see a lot of those. Like I'll, I'll <laughs> like a lot of newcomer musky mm-hmm. fishermen get the biggest net from Dick's, right? And like you said, that's it. It might be a big net, but that's. You put like a forty-inch pike in that net, and you see, you feel bad for that yeah. pike. It's like folded in half. Like you can tell, you gave it like mm-hmm. scoliosis yeah, from being in the net. It's but what are you gonna do? Like it's, if you're not a, if you are not on the in crowd, yeah. you're trying to get into it. Hey, dude, it's really hard. Tell it's hard. What's the story with this bad it's boy extremely here? Extremely hard. Oh man, that was uh, this past June. That was. <laughs> I don't know if you heard saw the movie Big Meg. It's a Megalodon. The Megalodon. Yeah, I nicknamed her Big movie. Meg. Yeah. So that one, man, that was that's the one I wanted my whole life. I mean, that was a just under forty three incher, and thick is like a dump truck, and it hit right at the boat, right at my feet. And I watched the whole thing, got it all on camera. That's awesome. <laughs> I mean, it, it was just, and like I kind of told the story about that one on my Instagram a little bit, but like that, that fish is like the one I wanted since I was a little kid. We talked about when I was little learning to fish, we'd go to deep Creek and we had no clue. What we were doing. I mean, we, we caught fish, we caught our bluegill, our bass, our perch, our pickerel, our usual suspects at deep Creek, but we wanted pike. Like anyone that's listening, like old timers know Johnny's bait house. It's since been renamed like five times. And I think it's closed now. But Johnny's Bait House was the spot to be if you were a fisherman. And we went in there when I was little with my dad. I was probably six years old, maybe. And some dude brought in a pike like that one I'm holding in that picture. He brought it in and threw it right on the counter. He wanted it weighed and measured. And it's like a little kid. I'm like, looking <laughs> at this fish like, oh, my God. Like, those live here. Like, why are we fishing for bluegill when we can go, go you know? And, and my poor dad, who, my my dad, his fishing experience was typical of, like, the American dad. Like, yeah. a rod in the garage and go once a year and so my poor dad is now tasked with catching me pike and he has no idea how to get them so i tell this i told my buddies i actually have them in the shop but our his fix his solution to us getting big pike was getting bigger bobbers 
it, yeah it, it, it wasn't it wasn't bigger bait it wasn't bigger minnows or suckers or big spit it was bigger bobbers and i still got the bobbers over there but yeah so for so long story short my whole life it was a goose chase for these stupid pike sorry i live on a road i've got a wild hog so beautiful by. but um <laughs> yeah but so this one man it was probably i don't know oh, shit, i want to say video. 20 years in the making maybe yeah and i was using like i said a glider like hate glide baits just fishing over like mid-depth weeds maybe 10 15 feet deep and we had fished all week and i caught some little pike and but honestly by little pike they're pike that i would have been thrilled with last year the year before like 30 33 34 but i wanted like the 40 incher and Why did this you was the day it like happened that? man it was you just, just it chucked was... it right behind the boat and it looks like it's on the outside not towards shore <laughs> yeah okay so my buddy Shout out to my buddy Chris. He calls that the Canadian side of the boat. Off into the abyss. You're not throwing at the shoreline anymore, right? So where I'm at, it's kind of like a weed bed that runs down the shoreline. And it kind of runs parallel with the shore. Like where I'm looking out the back of the boat. So video, your I'm boat is on the inside like the part of the weed edge bed. or on the outside part of the weed edge? Outside. Okay. Outside. Outside. I was and for the whole weed bed, hey. I was kind of throwing up into the weeds and working out of them. And for this one, for this one cast, whatever reason, I decided to turn and like throw down the edge of the weed bed and work it in a little deeper. Because I was like, how I like to fish for them is I'll st I don't like to get right up in those weeds. I'll stand off of them a little bit, you know, kind of throw up into them and work down. And where my boat is, it's it isn't in the weeds. It's kind of off of them. So gotcha. I'm throwing like down the edge of the weed bed, and that's. Mm -hmm. That was the cast that did it. She followed. She, I don't know if she followed it in or came out from under the boat or what. Oh my god, dude! Oh. Right <laughs> <laughs> Off to the races. It, it took probably 10, 15 yards of drag, and my girlfriend was there to That's net it. Perfect awesome. net job. Did I, oh, dude! How yeah, often man, do they was... actually like stay under the boat to ambush? Does that happen more often than not? Oh, that's. I don't know. So you guys have theories about that, that they'll like use the boat as cover and stuff. I don't know if I'm with that or not, but I'm, I feel following a lure. Like they see something they want to eat. They're not really worried about a boat. At all. I mean, the clear water, that's a different beast, but the lake like Deep Creek, I feel like if a pike wants to eat something, it doesn't care about your dumb boat. Like there's nothing stop. Like that fish right there, I couldn't have kept that lure out of its mouth if I tried my hardest. Mm -hmm. Like I could have like jumped in the water and it probably still would have ate it and then swam away. Like that's when they get that one track mine, they just, they're a predator. They want, they, you know what I mean? Dude, that bite though. I can see why you get addicted to that. That bite is oh, freaking awesome. That is so It really is. Cool. It's, there's nothing like it. And that's like you were saying, like, why did I switch over and like get away from everything else? That's kind of it. It's like higher stakes. Like you might not have the action that you had bass fishing or carp fishing or cat fishing, but. Like when it does happen, like when I, after I, that fish hit the net, I was screaming so loud that people came out of their rental houses down to the dock to like check and make sure everything was okay. Like that, I just, I absolutely, and I don't go, I'm pretty good at keeping my cool, like even with musky, but I went absolutely bananas. Like I've never gone that bananas over a fish. And that's like, that's what it's about. Like just that, that adrenaline. And that. It's like catching a 15 pound largemouth like every time, even if it's yeah. like a small musky or a small. No, I, I almost passed out when I caught my 40 incher i was just like that's, oh yeah. my god this that's a huge thing, fish it's a huge fish and it, as a bass yeah. guy it is a huge fish. yeah yeah it's um, a huge fish as a musky guy too I mean, especially a pike like that's that's the mark 40 man that's what how did you break down deep creek like did you just just close your eyes and put a pin on a map and say like yep this is where we're gonna start like no so I've gotten kind of lucky through the years. Like, so when we were little, granted, we knew we had no idea what we were doing, like I said, but we did get out in a boat, like, and that helped a lot. Like we, we got our rental pontoon from Bill's Marine and we went out into the lake with no fish finder, no nothing and kind of explored. Then that turned into, like I said, a few years ago, me and my girlfriend going down like six, seven years ago. And every year we kind of try to pick somewhere different, right? So we'll pick like somewhere on the east side one year, or like somewhere south one year. And every year I go for a week and I kind of try to stay there. Like I'm not going to stay at Thousand Acres down south and run north up to Wisp every morning to fish. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like if we're staying south that week, I'm going to fish there and I'm going to try to do my best to learn that area. And then next year stay somewhere else. And maybe I'll revisit a spot that I liked from the previous year, but... 
so every you, year I kind of try to mix it up a little. You really use that bottleneck of the state park as really your border. You're either going to be up or below. Yeah, you know, you could. I never thought of it like that, but you can definitely <laughs> say that for you. Yeah, for sure. And you know something funny? We used to when I was little, we used to say the man. Like, so yeah, if you look at the bottleneck, like from the bottleneck south, it kind of looks like a man, like his two feet and his arms. So would say like I'm on his hmm. head or I'm on his left arm, I'm on his right arm. Like we didn't refer to things as Cherry Cove and you know Thousand Acres. <laughs> this lake is also deceptively big as a guy. It's huge. It, the it, shoreline, it, yeah. yeah. It, the shoreline really helped, and and the fact that there's aquatic vegetation, it really helps mm-hmm. push out the angler, so it's not so condensed. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you're not packed up with a ton of fishermen by any means. W- were you specifically just looking for the best vegetation, or what? What in general were you looking for? Yep. Well, when I go, I mean, like I said, I can't really speak. My buddy, uh, shout out to Ryan Cooper. He's a local, and he's also a buddy of Matt. So he's the fall guy. He's the one to ask on the fall. But uh, in the summer, yeah, I'm looking for weeds. Yep. Like we got to, <laughs> I actually, I, we we. We like I said, we rent a place lakefront every year because I want to dock my boat there and fish like a nut all week. So pulling into our house this year, my girlfriend's on the dock, like waving me over, and I'm looking at my graph and like on side edge imaging, I saw a weed bed, and I just like did a complete UE. She's standing on the dock, like waving me over, and she saw me turn around and she like called me. She's like, "You were looking right at me." I'm like, "Yeah, I know. I found some weeds. Hold on." And I'm like, I'm off marking the weed bed and looking at it and seeing if it's like something I like. And, but yeah, weeds, dude. Weeds. Pike love weeds. That's good to know. So it really doesn't matter like what type then? It's just any weed it, is a good weed? So yeah, as, as far as like the type, I guess, I mean, there are guys that have preferences, but I think depth's a big deal. So like your shallow weeds, and by shallow, I mean like one to we'll say like 10 feet. We'll call that shallow. You're going to find pike there and you're going to find pickerel and like some times of the year during the spawn and when pike move shallow, you're going to find big pike there. But when I'm there in the summer, it doesn't seem like your big pike prefer those really, really shallow weeds, like the choked out kind of bow finny bassy weeds. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's your pickerel water. That's your small little snot rocket pike water where you're catching pike that are the same size as the pickerel. Like we talked about earlier, they yeah. behave differently, man. So you bump off into that like 10 to 20 feet of weeds. Now you're talking like predator area. Gotcha. And it's 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 harder to fish and it's a little more intimidating to fish than like target fishing like lily pads or something, you know. But it's that's where they like to live and So there is a depth factor, there's a magic sauce depending on the time of year and stuff that they're gonna be hanging in. I would say so. I mean not to say you can't like well, I've even seen it. So um anyone that knows Deep Creek knows uh Carmel Cove. I'll, it's like this little tiny, shallow, skunky, like three, when you get real back into it, it's like both in water, basically. And up until the big one I caught, the biggest fish I ever saw was back there in the summer. I was back there bass fishing and one, like a 40 plus just came up in porpoise right next to my boat. And I'm like, well, you shouldn't be here. Like it was like two feet of water weeds, like 80 degree water. I'm like, everything says that that fish should be out like under the thermocline or in deep weeds, you know, but there he is back in like frog water. That's crazy. Who knows what? So, but I would say, yeah, in general, general rule of thumb, definitely depth factor, like definitely a little deeper. And actually Matt, so the, another, like I said, great episode with him, man. I've, I think I've listened to that one like twice. I think I might listen to it every time on the way to deep Creek, <laughs> but, but yeah, like, but like he said, there's in the summer, it's kind of frowned upon to be fishing really deep for pike. Like, guys that'll find the thermocline and fish like under the thermocline for pike and haul big pike up 30, 40 feet out of the depth, you know, like that's not good for any fish. And you agree with that or do you have your own opinion? I I would agree. I would, I would tend to agree with that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's not good for a depth change and a, you know, an oxygen change like that on a fish, but you will find a lot of like that one I caught, I think I was in like 13 feet of water, Hmm. 13 feet of weeds. Like there are big fish still hunting up shallow in those weeds. And those are the ones like I want to target. I don't want to go haul them out of the depths and risk an injury, you know? Well, speaking of temperature, what are your thoughts on like, so one thing that I've, I've learned and I got into my education is about water temperature and river musky, you know, river musky Mm -hmm. here in Virginia are just, it's, it's a religion. And they Mm -hmm. talk about not trying most, not most, there's a, there's a section of them that say do not fish for them no matter what in the summertime you're going to kill them do yep. pike kind of fit into that same thing too when it comes to water temperature i don't know enough about them but i would imagine so i mean they're like 
they kind of tend to behave like a muskie. They t- they tend to like scoot out of that warm, real warm water, you know, when it gets warm. So I would think that, yeah, that's that's a good rule of thumb to probably until like research says otherwise. That's I'd, I'd take that rule of thumb. Yeah. So, so then just, re- you know, really let the public know again at what temperature do you think is the prime time, whether it's for muskie or pike? So kind of the rule of thumb with muskies 80 and there are guys that like right now there are muskie guys listening that just like punch their screen at me. They're like, that's stupid. Like I, I fish at 83 and they, there, there are guys that stop fishing at like 75 degrees, but I think 80 is your general rule of thumb. And I know there was just a study done where I think 80 was kind of like the baseline for hot water, but yeah, that's, that's, and I, I do notice that I can't say for pike cause I haven't really caught a lot of really cold water pike, but, you see that with cold water muskie, like on their release, like they're happy as a lark. You drop them back hmm. in the water, they'll soak you. They'll slap you in the face and soak you. And on you talking 75, 78, 80 degree water, it takes them a second to kind of get their bearings and they That's don't crazy. always swim off hard and fast. And hmm. there's, there's definitely a more, mortal- like that can't be argued. There's a mortality with hot water muskie fishing. Why is it on the outdoor network you'll see tons of ice fishing for pike, but you don't see that for muskie? Just I was just curious. I don't know, man. I so I have two local buddies, uh, Nick and Luke, that love ice fishing for muskie. It is but, a thing. Okay, cool. Yeah, so it is a thing. It's not popular, and I know the last few years it's been hard just because of the weather. Like we haven't had an ice season to ice fish mm-hmm. here, really. Like you're talking a day, a weekend, maybe. <laughs> It hasn't been like where it's like all December you can go pound the ice on our rivers. So, is it we, we, is it an ethical thing that people don't like to do it? Or I don't know if it's that. I mean, they're they're cold. They like they seem to do really well with the cold water. Okay. I mean, it's I don't think it's really ethics. I think it's more just uh, like a lack of resources and being able to maybe. Gotcha. I know it's popular as you go north in Pennsylvania, up around like Erie County. There are a lot of natural lakes. Where there are muskie and i think in the winter that's a little more common there guys pike and muskie fish through the ice up there but down my way like i said it's just a matter of our winters have been 60 degrees so yeah and i also think i guess this is something that just came to my head like there's just always going to be more pike in a system than muskie so if you're ice fishing yeah, it's going to be for sure it's way more of a lottery ticket it feels like Oh, for sure. I mean, so my buddies that do it, they're like absolute lunatics. They'll go out for like a weekend at a time and just live on the ice, Good like in a, in a shack, hoping for a muskie. They'll set their, you know, set their stuff, and I can. That's home that. for that's home until they catch a muskie. That's it's not well, like perching where you're going out in the morning and coming home at night or. I, I, some of the stuff I've seen on TV, if you get the live scope where they hook it up to like a 40 inch TV and you're in a warm, that thing looks awesome for a weekend. You have yeah, a lot that's of beer. Living. That is going to be awesome. Mm-hmm. Or like the little, they have like the trucks that they yes. hit like a button and they lower them down to the ice. Yes. I yeah, could, you die here. There's no ice for that. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time you went ice fishing? I don't think I can remember the last time I did it. It's been a Believe long Believe it or not. People are going to roll their eyes at me. I've never been ice fishing. And it, that started as a kid because my parents wouldn't let me. They were like, it's dangerous. You're not allowed, right? So as growing up, I never bought ice fishing stuff. I never bought the... Uh, last year was the first year I ever got ice fishing rods, actually. Hmm. And I was hoping to go out, and we never had a day to go. And that, it, that was crazy because, like, I think Deep Creek is the only place consistently around us that, that has hmm. ice fishing, if I'm not mistaken. That's because Garrett County, the weather there is just like hell on earth. <laughs> So that they'll always have ice, even in like the age of fires, they'll be frozen still. Dude, you don't have to worry about them. Didn't they have snow in June or like May? I believe it. Like, it might be snowing now in Garrett <laughs> County. You never know there. It's just like total hell. You look at the, like we go down every year in the forecast. I don't even look at it unless it's like super bad because every day it's like there's a chance of rain. Mm-hmm. There's never a perfect, even on a day where there's no chance of rain, like, you know, there's a chance of rain. Speaking of total, what it is? Yeah, I mean, speaking of total hell, how do you catch fish out of three rivers? Because everyone <laughs> oh. that I know calls that Schittsburg, basically. It is. Yeah, it's tough, man. It's 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 a, it's a needle in a haystack game, but there are things you can do to like put the odds in your favor. So the PA Fish and Boat Commission has a stalking history, like going back a really long time, and they break that down by pool. So you're not talking, when they say they stalk the Mon River, they're not talking about the whole Mon River. They're going to narrow that down to like one of six or one of five pools or whatever. And you can look at that data and kind of see where your odds are a little better because they don't stalk all pools evenly. That, that's like a regional thing. Like they may only stalk 
hundred musky in one pool, whereas the other pool gets like six hundred or hmm. something crazy. And I know there are pools that totally see stocking. Like there are years that they don't get stocked. And it's that that can really help there. Just picking a, a high probability spot because it's 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 massive water. You're talking the Mon, the Allegheny, the Ohio. They're huge. So you really have to kind of break that down. I mean, just excluding them in like a raised town, it's insane how big the state of Pennsylvania is. And if you exclude like raised town and Lake Erie, there's just not a lot of big lakes for the size of the state. Mm. It's kind of crazy. Nope. I'd say Pima Tuning's like our big one. That's where all the local guys, that's our big water there. How many acres? Unless you run into Lake Erie. What's that? How many acres? Oh, I don't know. A lot. It's it's huge. It's it's partially in Ohio and Pennsylvania. I could probably look it up real quick, but I don't know. If Not Lake Erie, that. the pine. Yeah, pine. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's bigger than Deep Creek. I know that. It's much bigger okay. than Deep Creek. So between 10,000 and 20,000 acres probably. So I would say, yeah. Yeah. Like that. I mean, that's not bad because, yeah, it's always been fascinating to me when you look at that part of the country, like from Virginia up and, you know, this was a rabbit hole I went down and that's because they started all the TVA projects basically around World War II, and they just worked their way up the coast. And by the time you got to Kerr and stuff, you know, you were at the 60s when all that stuff was done with because all Greenpeace. And it's it's crazy mm-hmm. that they would have just kept going up the East Coast if they had their way. And good yeah. Lord, would this place look differently if we had another reservoir? Uh-huh, I bet. Yeah, we we don't have a whole lot to pick from up here. It's, that's kind of why I turned into a river rat, honestly. West Virginia is bad too, man. They got like, yeah. it's worse for them. So there, <laughs> this is totally off topic. Not, it has nothing to do with Pike or Deep Creek, but Love somewhere it. in West Virginia, when we would vacation there, when I was little, we would hit all the time was Jennings Randolph Lake. And that I've, lake still holds a special place in my heart. I love that lake. Why? It's just weird. Is it, <laughs> have you ever been there? Is it, is it not like a weird lake to be at? I had, so like, yeah. The, the way we got there was down this like stone road that as a kid, I swear was like five hours long. It was like from deliverance, the movie, like just this creepy old stone road. And it would open up into this like beautiful, clear, like hundreds of foot deep lake. Like it, it was just a weird place to be. And I loved it. I still love it. Oh, I said, wow. Yeah, right, right never, d- never done well there. Like I, I don't say I love it because it's like a knockout fishing place for me. I just love the weirdness of it. It's just a surreal kind of atmosphere. All those lakes in West Virginia, and I gotta. Go, and guys, again, if you're listening to this show, if anyone wants to come on and talk about West Virginia lakes, like Mount Storm and the history there, I'd love to have you on to talk about them because I know Mount Storm is like the closest nuclear reactor lake we have in that area. In that area of the country, I think it's Lake Anna there, and I think there's another one that I'm probably missing to get warm water discharge. But th- th- that's also very interesting. Um. Mm-hmm. Side note, Raystown Muskie. Do you ever do you ever participate in that? So I have not, but I have buddies that do. I, I think Raystown. Sucks. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a wild place. I think it's kind of gotten its mark more for being like the striper kind of place to be, but that's a hike for me, man. Where I'm at, like just outside of Pittsburgh, that's a three, four, or five hour drive, depending <sighs> on traffic. All right, I got it. I gotta yeah. do this. Here we go. Hold on. Uh, oh, I need to find you. So I am technically, you see Greensburg, just southeast of Pittsburgh. That's roughly where oh, I'm Oh, shit, at. yeah. You were not joking. Yeah. So I'm right on top of, like, the rivers, which is, like I said, that's kind of why almost by default I've grown to like the rivers, just because I hate driving, and I hate driving four hours round trip to fish. <laughs> Cook-like. Key, keystone. Okay. Yeah, we, yeah, we have a lot of... Not a lot of musky reservoirs. Like I said, are, you could probably, I'd say maybe 10 places, like mm-hmm. solid places to pick from as far as like musky lakes. How wide is, do you know the Shenandoah River by chance? Like, do you, can you visualize it? I can't. That's another place I've never been to. I'm trying it's to, a little bit out of my reach. What well, I'm trying to think of, a, uh, it's not the Susquehanna. I'm trying to visualize how wide is the Allegheny? So that varies. As you go north, the Allegheny kind of becomes real skinny white watery kind of like as the yawk enters maryland if you think of the yawk in maryland yes so right you, like white water kind of so you could throw a rock kinda, across it type of deal in some places yeah and it's like okay. kind of sketchy and dangerous but as you get down towards me they all three rivers kind of start to resemble one another like real wide maybe two three hundred two hundred yards wide we'll say and slow moving but for the most part 
yeah, they, they're kind of featureless, sunken barges, old industry. The, the reason I bring that up is I just I just had Jake Harshman on who just won mm-hmm. two back-to-back kayak tournaments, I think it was the same day. But w- what was interesting that he brought up that, that stuck in my mind is the Susquehanna is a freaky river because it's so damn wide. And mm-hmm. most rivers, he said, you fish basically upstream or downstream. There you fish left and right because they're so wide. And <laughs> me being an upper Potomac Shenandoah guy, our rivers are narrow. So you could sit dead nut in the center. You can hit left bank, right bank pretty much on a good cast. Mm-hmm. And the way he talked, it just really opened my mind that depending on the river, how you look at it, where, yeah, maybe you start on the left bank and you have enough width that you can then yeah. scoot over. And I didn't know, like, what is your approach for these rivers like the Allegheny? Is it narrow where, yeah, you just sit dead nuts and you hit all your casts? Or are you going to work left to right? So I'm right off the bat. I'm more of a Mon guy because I'm the closest for me is the Monongahela River. Okay. Yeah, but it's it's the same deal on all of them for me. I mean, it's you're dealing with a lot of dead water and a lot, like they say, what's that cheesy quote? Like ninety percent of the fish are in ten percent of the water, yes. and that's like so damn true with musky and all that. So you're not necessarily like out in the middle of the river, just like hopelessly bombing cast. You know, you're just kind of picking your high percentage spots. That may be you're at a dam a lock or something you know and you're fishing around cover there or you may be fishing like a rock shoreline that's just there you might like you might have a bank with nothing and then a 50 yard stretch with some rock so it's like in the rivers it's, it is a lot of target fishing i'd say and it's, you brought something up interesting about oh i guess boy. running and gunning but mm-hmm. if you're a bank guy you're sitting there and you're just making that same cast when you have a boat how mm-hmm. much are you in your own head about okay there's this one opening where a creek dumps into the river do I sit here all day or is it three casts and we bounce to a new spot? So I'm, I have buddies that have like ADD. They'll, <laughs> I barely get Delora and hooked off my rod and they're like, all right, let's go. Me, I'm like the exact opposite. I will like beat a horse dead in a spot. Like if I'm confident somewhere, like has fish, if I've seen a fish there recently or like maybe even that day, I will ride that storm out. Just knowing that, like, I'm not going to waste time looking for another fish if, like, I know I'm on fish. Mm. And that's that's honestly how I play the Deep Creek Pike, too. Like, I get one week, so I'm not, unless I'm forced to, I'm not going to go looking for some fancy new spot. I'm going to go to, like, the high percentage spots where I've seen fish. I know there's fish there. And that's that's musky right there, man. That's And then you're talking moon phases. Like, musky guys are big into the moon. Like, you have a window, right? Next, yeah. yeah, so, yeah, so, like, major, minor, you're talking, like, half hour, hour windows, so... You don't want to just be off in the middle of the Mon River, just hopelessly bombing casts during like the best moon phase. You want to be on that spot where you're confident in, like you've seen a fish, you know. So with pike and muskie, do you believe in all that with the moon phases? I do. I'm a bit of a tin hat kind of guy. I have friends that don't and I have friends that do. And I I do believe in it just because it might be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Again, it might be that you're checking your phone like, oh, now's the major. So you're fishing your ass off, right? But I've just seen it too many times where you've fish you fish your butt off all day you see nothing and then you get some action and then we don't even look like we'll go back and look after the fact like what time was that picture 7 30 what time was the major like 7 28 like what well, okay so explain to me why you know we were doing the right thing for 14 hours why did we have a window in that you know 10 minutes it, it could be coincidental but it's just it happens so much that you start to you do start to believe it <laughs> And guys, like uh, just for if you guys are not aware of this, the idea is between a full moon and new moon and different lunar, um, uh, different lunar activities is going to be bite windows with musky, with pike, and then also I've heard this with with largemouth too when it comes to their spawn as well. It's generically what we're talking about there, and I think that's interesting. I think something happens. I don't know what, yeah. but something happens. Yeah, man, the, the animals are more in tune with uh, with it than us. I think, and I think I even think we're in tune with it. We just don't realize it. Cause you ever had like weird shit happen on a full moon? You're like, oh, it must be a full moon. So people are being weird. My wife is an interpreter and she has to take phone calls all the time. Uh-huh. And she says on a full moon, you get more hospital calls. Hmm. Uh, people like either like drug addicts, you know, yeah. cop things, all that stuff says happens around a full moon. I have friends that work in hospitals too. They say the same thing. It's like, yeah, we get the crazies on a full moon. So mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, there's they something get, to yeah, it. There's something with that moon, man. And it's and it's not to say that if like you're not inside of a peak lunar event to just hang the rods up. Like we've caught plenty of musky outside of events, but that's it's not to be forgotten. We'll say that. Do you, <laughs> Definitely pay attention. Do you adjust the size of your bait when it comes to the moon phases at all? Not really, no. I mean, I, w- I would say the only adjusting is like confidence, just like your confidence mm. spot during during a moon phase. I'm not going to be throwing like a lure my buddy just gave me to be like, hey, try this out. 
see how it runs. Like I want to throw something I know works, something I know I'm efficient with on a spot that I know could hold a fish, you know? How much we'll are... Say, oh, go go for it. Finish thought. I was just I was just going to say like save the searching and experimenting for like other times maybe. Like that that's like your your main event right there. Think of it that way. And that ties into you you have your juice. Uh, well, let's just again deep creek and, and and you're fishing for mm-hmm. a pike, but I think this also goes with musky. How much will you being on the spot affect the fish? So example is maybe you run up on the spot a little bit too much. I feel like with bass, it will push them off. I think this with big swim baits too. If you throw a big swim bait, it'll pull fish off the key area. And if you don't get bit, and I've seen this on live scope with when I when I shoot four facing center, they'll just stay there like idiots. And you almost have Out to open. Yep. And you almost have to like mm. drive off fish somewhere else and come back so they set back up. Do you the ever reset, yeah. So do you think that happens with pike and musky where it's like, I need to give this place a little bit of time and come back so they set back up? Yeah. I mean, in particular, like if you see a fish, like if you have one come, like I've, I've had this with pike at Deep Creek and I've had it with musky too. Like you have a fish come in hot on a lure. Maybe it takes a swipe at a bait. Maybe it gets hooks. Maybe it doesn't. It's kind of traditional practice to like not beat that fish up. Like you said, kind of because you don't know what that fish did. It could be hanging out there. It could, I mean, not to say I might not pitch a cast back and, you know, yeah. see if he comes back out, but I'm not going to stay there for another two hours relentlessly trying to get that fish to eat again. I'm going to back off, kind of let, like you said, let it reset, let the spot reset and come back. Because one thing that just came to mind is I see this a lot with smallmouth on clear and clear and weedy bodies of water. The fish will start using your boat as shade. Uh, especially yeah, in deeper portions. It. And I've seen this a lot to be like, I'll have, I'll take a fish, I'll throw them in the, in the live one, I leave my bait over the side and they'll come straight up from underneath. And I look back <laughs> down and they're all underneath the boat and I wouldn't get bit. And it took a while for me. It's like, oh shit, I'm going to leave, come back. Mm-hmm. So they're not using the boat as structure anymore and let them reset back up. And yeah. I've always thought that like, would a pike do that? And it kind of makes sense. Like, yeah, if it misses the lure, absolutely, it'll just dive under the boat and just chill there. You know, the weird way to tie it all together is like the, we just talked about the mood phases and we're talking about this now. I've caught pike on Deep Creek where that's happened before. Like I've moved a pike out of the weeds. I've seen him. He's come up like maybe taking a swipe at a lure and gone away. And I'm like, OK, I'm going to save him for peak moon. You know? Like I see my majors at 645 tonight. I'm going to come at 645. I'm going to be right here with what he likes and I'm going to catch him. Mm. You know, like that's a good way to play that one, too. That's interesting. If, if your moon sets up in a way that allows you to do that, that can be effective. Yeah, I, I want to start fishing more with the moon phases as, as much as I can. Just, I think I think that for bass fishermen, I guess it's more for big fish hunting versus tournament guys because a tournament mm-hmm. guy, he's out there. Like he doesn't care enough. Maybe yeah, about the yeah. Moon phases. And that when it comes down to is that that's kind of musky too. Like you just got to get out there. Like you don't don't say oh the moon's at six thirty tonight I'm not going until five thirty. You know just put your time out there and maybe like we said during the moon phase be a little more like have a little more of a hair trigger during the moon phase and but don't just eliminate everything else. You know and like I, I'm saying this and there are musky guys probably listening like rolling their eyes like oh screw the moon phases I catch them all the time and they they probably do. But it's it's kind of like we said the gear to each their own and I mean it's again it, I would I would take it back to like tidal fishing like yeah you can mm. catch them on a slack tide it mm-hmm. sucks though it's not your best time so mm. why not hedge your chips at the right time exactly yep Tom I, the nail on the head I can't thank you enough for coming on here um please like what can we give a shout out to please please give some plugs I mean if anyone if anyone likes musky fishing or think they may want to get into it want to get into a little punishment our podcast the musky hunks we kind of try to cater to the beginner you know we're not really talking like tournament level really really in the weeds kind of stuff like we're talking to the beginner guy so that, i mean would would all appreciate it if you gave that a listen um i just started making rubber baits uh, saddle tramp bait co.com you give them a look i've got do you have some to show bigger. off um yes i do i have one hanging here actually start Let pimping your play. products yeah, it was just playing with the rigging, you know. Got a little uh, you external see, rigging. That going looks like can't... a mag draft. I swear to God, that I like that paddle tail. Yeah, I'm trying to get it out of my blurry yeah. Saddam Hussein background, but yeah. So I got the hybrid tail going on on it. Huh? Uh, I can't. There we go. The hybrid tail. And this is the 10 inch. I don't have them on the site yet. I have the six and the eights on the site, but I'm going for the externally rigged, which is crazy action. I mean, you probably know too, like externally rigged while it may be more of a rigging nuisance the action just crushes internal rigging so that whole bait moves 
So that's been fun. That's where my time's been going. But like I said, I was doing that before we hopped on here, probably what I'll do after. And Well, again, guys, uh, link in the episode description to hit their podcast. It's really, really good. I just, I just gave you, it a man. listen. Uh, Musky Hunks podcast. They have had some big name guests. And like you said, Joe Sorelli fishing on the B side. Like that's freaking awesome. <sighs> highlight of my highlight of my fishing life. Probably that night. My friends all make fun of me for it. I was like a little girl at a Jonas Brothers concert, man. All right. Well, great, dude. Because we can't always end like I feel like professionally. You have a story <laughs> with Joe Schmelli, anything like that? Like, was there just starstruck? Is he a cool guy? Like, what uh, was that like? he, oh, yes. Start off, he's the coolest dude. He makes everyone feel like, whether you know him or not, he is just so down to earth. It makes you feel like you're one of the boys. Like, as soon as he signed on, it felt like we knew him for years. There was no weirdness, there was no awkwardness. He was just so cool so open about all of his experiences and his opinions and you know i i I still go to him for advice about the podcast so he's he's a great resource anyone listening if you the crazy thing is if you want to message him you could probably get a response from him within a half hour he is so responsive to like his fans and people that like his work just that's freaking awesome yeah so that was that was awesome that's really cool. And again, guys, like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out in the algorithm. Link in the episode description, everything we talked about as well, including to our Patreon. Um, we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.